Okay. Good morning to everybody. My name is uh, Yuri Timrov. I'm going to talk about the Hubbard interactions from density functional perturbation theory. This work uh, is going on in uh, Epefeld at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in collaboration with uh, Matteo Cococcioni and Nicola Marzari. So my talk will be about the new code of quantum espresso to compute Hubbard U parameter from ab initio. So this is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to give some uh, very brief introduction. Then I'm going to describe very briefly the traditional linear response method to compute the Hubbard U parameter developed by uh, Matteo and Stefano uh, de Geroncoli. Then I'm going to talk uh, about the new code which we are developing now, and then I will conclude my talk. Just to remind to all of us what is DFT plus U, uh, in DFT plus U, uh, the total energy is given as the sum of the LDA or GGA total energy plus the correction, which is the Hubbard uh, correction energy, which is given by this expression where we have summation over atoms and uh, states M1, M2. U labels the Hubbard parameter, Hubbard U parameter, and then N are the occupation matrices which are defined as two scalar product between Conchembe functions and localized orbitals. In practice, we have to solve the modified uh, Conchembe equation where we have the extra Hubbard potential defined uh, like this. So in order to perform DFT plus U calculation, we have to know the value of the U parameter. And this is actually the, the goal of my talk to, to, to discuss how to determine the U parameter. Sometimes people uh, fit their uh, data to the experimental data and then in this way they obtain the U parameter. But we can also try to compute it from uh, first principles. There are, and there are several methods to do it. The uh, first of them is the constrained DFT approach and there are several flavors. And in this talk, I will consider the uh, method by Matteo and Stefano. Then there are other methods like constrained uh, RPA approach, unrestricted Hartree-Fock approach, and ACBN0 uh, functional, developed by uh, Buongiorno, Mar Marco Mogiornardelli and, and the collaborators. So in this talk, as I said, I will consider constrained DFT approach by Matteo and Stefano. Very briefly, what this method is about. So uh, we have to solve the modified Conchem equation where we have, I, I highlight in red color, this is kind of a penalty function where alpha is the strength of the perturbation and this is the summation over the uh, localized orbitals. Essentially, this is a projector on the uh, manifold of lo localized states for a specific atom J. So what we do in practice, we have to construct a supercell. For example, this is an example of uh, lithium cobalt oxygen too. And what we do in practice, we uh, essentially change slightly the occupations on one atom. For example, this is uh, cobalt. So we change slightly the occupation on cobalt. And then we solve this, this uh, equation for several values of alpha. We need just two, two values. Uh, and in this way, we do the calculation and occupations on all atoms also change slightly. Then using the finite differences, we can compute the change of the occupation matrices with respect to the change in the, uh, with respect to the, this uh, parameter, strength parameter. So we can compute the chi, which is the uh, interacting response function and chi naught, non-interacting response function. Essentially, chi naught is the value computed after the first iteration when we don't have Hartree and exchange correlation contribution. And chi is the self-consistent one. And finally, we have to invert. These are, these are the matrices with the dimension i and j, which label the atoms. And so we have to invert chi and chi naught and take the difference. And this will give us, uh, again, the matrix. And we take the diagonal of this matrix, which is the Hubbard U parameter, the on-site effective Coulomb interaction. This is the U parameter. So as I said, in practice, we take our system, 
for example, uh, lithium cobalt oxygen 2, which there are four atoms in a primitive cell, we construct a supercell, let's say two by two by two, and we perturb one atom, let's say cobalt, and we compute the response <laughs> of the whole system. Then we perturb another atom, oxygen, and we again compute the response. Then there is a lithium atom, but we don't perturb it because it has only S states, which are not uh, strongly uh, localized, so we, we don't need to perturb it. Whereas cobalt has D states and oxygen has P states, so we perturb those atoms. We don't have to perturb all of them, just we perturb uh, of w one type of atoms, for example, cobalt, oxygen, and that's all. But if this is a high symmetry case, if the system has a lo low symmetry, so let's say those, these two cobalt are not equivalent. Let's say we, we shift a little bit this oxygen, so they are not equivalent by symmetry. So we have to perturb uh, both oxygens. So this is the idea. What is the problem here? That when we perturb uh, a cobalt atom, like uh, here in the origin, let's say, it can interact with its periodic image because we are using uh, periodic boundary conditions. So it can interact with its... Uh, images, and this gives a fake contribution, and we obtain not a correct result for the Hubbard U parameter. So in practice, we have to make a convergence tests with respect to the size of the supercell. So we, let's say, increase uh, the 222 supercell to 4 by 4 by 4. We recompute again the Hubbard U parameter, and we change if it changes or not with respect to the smaller case. If it's not yet converged, we, can, we should increase more the supercell. Mm -hmm. But this is, we know that the scaling of the su supercells is cubic, and this is the, the problem. So essentially, the cubic scaling uh, is not, uh, it's, a, it's a bottleneck, it creates problems. Then, in this approach, uh, it's not u really uh, user friendly because we have to do many things by hand. Yes, we can try to write scripts. But for every system, we have to adapt the script. It's not really, if you want to do high throughput calculations for thousands of materials, we don't want to bother with all these details. It's quite, kind of, kind, quite cumbersome to use in practice, and it takes time. So uh, we decided to try to develop a more automated code to compute Hubbard U parameters. So this is our motivation. We don't want to use supercells because of the cubic scaling. Uh, we were inspired by the phonon code, so we want to use the primitive cells with k points and q points. So essentially, like in phonon, we, we don't want to use a frozen phonon approach approximation. We want to use DFPT with primitive cells and q points. So we, we want to use the same idea here. Then we don't want to use finite differences method we want to compute directly the derivatives of quantities, like response functions, like in Fronon again. And as I said, we want a more automated way of computing the Hubbard U parameters to do high throughput studies. Very briefly, without going into the details of the theory, what we do in practice, we solve the linear system, like in Fronon. We know that in Fronon there are solver of the linear system. We do the same. But in our case, the perturbation is this uh, projector, which is essentially change in the occupations of, on the atoms. So we perturb our system and we solve this uh, equation, where this is the response constant wave function, constant potential, response constant potential, and the perturbation. We solve it. We get the response constant wave functions, and we compute the response occupation matrix, which is defined like this where we essentially we compute the scalar product of the, the response wave function with the localized orbital and the ground state constant wave function with the localized orbital and the, the complex conjugate term. In this way, we compute the response functions, chi naught and chi, and invert them as usually and take the difference. So the level of theory is exactly the same as was developed by Stefano and uh, Matteo. But this is just more, let's say, faster way and more elegant, probably. So, so far, we went from uh, finite differences to the uh, linear, to, to this uh, 
direct calculation of the, of the response wave function. The second step is to go from supercells to primitive cells by using the Q points in the primitive cell. Again, this is the same idea as in phonon. Essentially, we represent uh, our response wave function in the supercell as a sum over the uh, response wave functions for different values of the Q, Q, uh, Q vectors uh, in the primitive cell. And we sum up over all perturbations for different Q points and, and taking into account the phase. And we can do the inverse relation, express delta Q psi as uh, uh, with respect to the d psi over d alpha and sum up over the all cells. And in this way, we can also represent occupation, response occupation matrix again as a sum over of the Q points. And these are the re occup response occupation matrices for different Q points, which are defined in terms of lattice periodic functions, delta, U, uh, delta QU. These are the lattice periodic uh, also functions of uh, block sums of localized orbitals, which depend on K points now. And uh, that's it. So this method is, uh, we implemented it in, in the development version of Quantum Express. It's, uh, it's still uh, private. We're still testing it and finishing the implementation. So, so far, we managed to arrive at the point where the code works with norm-conserving and ultra-soft pseudo-potentials for insulators and metals, uh, spin-unpolarized and spin-polarized case. Uh, we can also use symmetry. It was quite uh, tricky. Then... Uh, we can use the parallelization over plane waves and key points. And we can use the uniform Q point grids using symmetry and non uniform grid without symmetry because it's also in, in phonon, it's uh, disabled. If one wants to use Q grid which is not uh, uniform, the code, uh, uh, let's say, gives you a warning that the Q2R code will not work. But in principle, you can try to do the calculation, but it's, kind of, it's, it's an issue, probably. Then, now let's see the results. Let us compare the, the new approach uh, on the basis of density function perturbation theory, where we use the primitive cell with just four atoms of lithium cobalt oxygen 2 system. And let's use the k-point grid and q-point grid, which are equal, and they are 2 by 2 by 2. So it's not necessary that they are equal. I just for this example, I take them equal because I want to compare this calculation with the uh, old school, uh, let's say, way of computing the Hubbard U parameter when we use the 222 supercell where there are 32 atoms and just gamma point sampling. And this we compute with the traditional method of Stefano and Matteo. So we expect that these two calculations should give us the same values of the U parameter. And if it, this is the case, this validates our method. And here, this is the table for several calculations uh, for metallic and non-metallic systems, magnetic, non-magnetic. And you can see this column is the traditional way of computing U, and this is the, 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 the way of using our new method. And we can see that the values for the U parameter agree up to the few mil electron volts, which is, I think, a validation of the method. Just a small remark that these values are not yet converged because, of course, this is not uh, too small grids and too small supercell. It's just the consistency between two, two ways of computing new parameter. And then just to show you how we can uh, converge the values of the new parameter, this is the U value for the cobalt, and this is for oxygen. And we see that when we increase the Q grid, 222, 444, 666, and 888. It converges monotonically. And already, at for Q point grids, 666, it's, it's already satisfactory. It depends which accuracy you want. And K point grid was used here, uh, 6 by 6 by 6. So you see, we can use different grids for K points and Q points. OK. And to conclude my talk, so I have shown you about our recent developments on the calculation of the Hubbard U parameter. It's case linearly with respect to the Q points uh, versus the cubic scaling and supercells. And 
On top of that, when we can use symmetry for Q point grids. It lowers even more the, the computational requirements. So we really gain a lot in CPU time. Then it is easy to perform convergence tests of you, just simply increasing the density of the Q grid. We can control the accuracy of the U parameter. When we solve the linear system, we can define the thresholds and we can really accurately control the, the precision, whereas with finite differences, it's, it has a lower, let's say, precision. And finally, and the most importantly, all this is done in particular to perform uh, high throughput calculations thanks to the user friendliness and uh, automation of, of this approach. In future, we would like to port the, the, the code from the current version, which is 5.0.2, to the latest version on SVN and profit from the existence of the LR modules and move all our dependencies from the phonon code to the LR modules. And then some other methodologic, methodological developments. We would like to try other more generic ways of defining the perturbation, uh, which would allow us to avoid inversions of chi naught and chi. <coughs> and this would allow us also to study closed shell systems and uh, compute magnetic excitations. So closed shell systems currently is the problem for traditional method. But we would like to try to address this issue with the new, the, the new method. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>